Okay, over to you. Thank you and good morning. And thank you very much to City UK for allowing me to come and speak this morning on something that's a little more positive than what I usually come to the city to talk about, which is the onslaught of EU legislation. I'm sure many of you have already heard me opine on EMIR, MIFID, AI, MFE, and even the FTT. But today I've got a more pleasant acronym to talk to you about, the EU 2020 strategy. Now the EU 2020 strategy is about restarting the EU economy. All the austerity measures in the UK and beyond, all throughout the EU, will not yield results if we don't manage to put the EU back on a growth course. So the EU 2020 strategy is a list of some 50 targets, a roadmap for all the future EU initiatives to bind the 27 member states together and these initiatives together to achieve some focus as well as some unity of purpose. So for me, the most important target that Commissioner Barroso has actually put in place is probably the 3% of EU GDP should be invested into research and development, both private and public. I started my career as a biomedical scientist and used my knowledge in the scientific field to then actually become a corporate financier, bringing capital and funding to the pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies engaged in research and innovation. That innovation we now so desperately need in Europe to restart growth. While some of my parliamentarian colleagues would like to believe that all bankers are casino bankers and that all financiers are somehow immoral, I do try to remind them from time to time that you play a vital role in getting capital into the real economy and facilitate that growth. Yet perhaps this is also the answer to the question that I was given in today's speech as to what opportunities there are for the financial sector to gain from that EU 2020 strategy. Now currently the EU is trying to use what little resources it has to target growth industries. Yet in my experience to date, civil servants and bureaucrats are the worst qualified to choose winners. Yet venture capitalists, private equity firms and banks do it every day. You choose which companies to invest in, what conditions need to be applied in order to ensure management stability and product success, and which, in which to foster long-term relationships <laughs> for your own future, which is symbiotic with their growth in a risk-managed way. And now that credit is becoming a little more difficult for banks to come by, and the future capital requirements enforced by Basel and by the EU will mean that there will genuinely be less money for banks to lend out to businesses, EU money now needs to provide co-investment opportunities to boost available investment capital, that the banks provide co-investment and business acumen so that we can select the best investment opportunities within Europe for growth. Now, speaking as an MEP for a constituency which still receives EU money in the form of structural funds, my observations are that they're not often well spent. And I'd love to see some of that EU money invested, not spent, so that they return a profit on that investment for the next generation of businesses. And I believe that the financial services sector is key to getting those investment strategies correct. Now, although I've been keen to learn that Barclays, Lloyd's, Santander, and RBS, amongst others, have received EU money in the past for partnership schemes, co-investing with the EIB, I do question why it's not being used more often in this country. And under the current research framework, number seven in the EU system, the innovation program, the UK has only received 2.8 billion out of the 37 billion spent so far under this framework. Whereas Spain and Italy have each received over 6 billion and France and Germany have also taken 4 billion each of that pot. The UK has some of the best universities in Europe and a highly skilled population. And yet we don't seem to be able to tap this potential pool of money and getting the products out into the, the wider market from those research institutions. We need to make sure that our skilled financiers aid our scientists and academics in sourcing all available capital to them at whatever stage of development they may be and to commercialize those ideas effectively. Now, beyond the specificities of the EU 2020, in particular, 
the digital agenda and the innovation partnership, I think we also need to find opportunities in other pieces of legislation, not just to focus on the negatives and the costs involved in implementation, but to look at the opportunities that could be created, especially through the benefit of the EU single market. We need to facilitate pan-European trade in goods and services at a higher level than we currently do. And I also think we can use these new frameworks to launch ideas. And I do believe, unlike many politicians, that there is a power to the financial services in order to innovate, and not just complex financial products, but to innovate on behalf of the real economy too. Now within MIFID II, which I'm hugely familiar with, and many of you will know, I spend a lot of time working on it, there is a proposal within it to create a new SME market. And of all the many thousands of lobbyists that come to see me from the City of London and beyond, there's only one group so far that have spoken to me about this one article on the development of SMEs for Europe. And they came to me saying they saw huge potential within this. Now, while we may have the AIM market in the UK, no one claims that this is the universal model for SME funding. And perhaps the future SME market could be structured so that smaller companies are encouraged to reduce their reliance upon debt and to instead look at the equity option more often. We could look at facilitating this governmentally by introducing tax treatments that actually evolved to support a new structure of this kind. And it is conceivable that we could create a new SME index that people could invest in like social or ethical investment options and policies. Or specifically, we could designate an SME growth category with preferential tax benefits for those investors. Now, after two and a half years of sitting in the European Parliament, and fighting the excess of financial services legislation, I would love for financial institutions come to my office to tell me about some of the positive things they would be able to do to restart the economic growth in Europe. And I do believe that the financial services sector can offer the rest of the economy a key to unfolding that growth. The financial services sector can come up with real and credible plans to convince the politicians and the public that they really are the linchpin for the real economic recovery in Europe and beyond. Now, finding innovative ways to improve the functioning of the market so that liquidity increases across the whole spectrum of market capitalization stocks is important. Finding the key to funding entrepreneurs. Why can't we have a more active EU venture capital strategy? We need to seek to positively engage our long-term investors in the growth opportunities which are offered over a long-term horizon that our smaller growth companies will offer them. Pension funds may be committing to a percentage of their investments in smaller high growth potential companies would have a positive impact on both liquidity and encourage the equity funding model whilst boosting their own pension fund returns. The industry needs to promote its financing role, and it also needs to promote its corporate finance activities, which need to serve the SMEs, as well as the global partners acquisition strategies, where the main focus for the larger institutions has lay in the last decade. Now, there is a huge opportunity within the 2020 strategy for financial services to partner in that development of growth. It's also an opportunity to re-engage with the businesses you serve. Growth is the key to the EU's future, and I very much believe that the hands of its future growth are in your hands and in the services you deliver. I'd be very happy to answer any questions on any details you would like to ask on that strategy. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Let's see if I can have my eye caught by. In, in the middle there, and then one to the side there. Maybe that will. Just try and pass the microphone down. Thank you. Tim Ward. 
Tim Ward from the Quoted Companies Alliance. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, your idea of creating a specific uh, asset class for uh, small and medium enterprises? I can indeed, Tim, and I wasn't going to name check any particular organization, but it was Tim's organization who has actually come with the very interesting <laughs> ideas on the SME asset class. So he's not getting away with that question without at least the name check on it. And I'm sure he can actually opine a lot longer than I can because he's had time to flesh this out. But certainly we've started early discussions with colleagues since we've, we last met in, in just a, a short period of time where there really is excitement about the potential to create a spe specific asset class where if we can persuade member states through their taxation regimes to support it also and to also get those long-term investors to stand behind it, we stand a chance of getting real money into that sector. And I spend so much of my time talking to people like the high frequency trading strategy operators about what we need to do to get the whole market working rather than just the very liquid names. And this is one way I think we could potentially, with the benefit of taxation measures, actually start to get greater interest and liquidity into those smaller stocks. But we need the member states to take the lead in this. Taxation really is going to be key to delivering it and actually getting some form of break for investments in that particular subsector if we can get them defined as an individual asset class. But that means it's a member state issue because taxation of all the matters in the EU is actually a sovereign state matter. And so we need to make sure that the EU doesn't class it as any form of state aid, but we also need to make sure that each and every member state is on board with the concept. We've started that. I will continue that across my tours of the EU over the coming months to make sure that we try and get buy-in from each and every member state. And even if we don't, and we get the EU to support it as a measure, then the UK is the key place to start for those UK businesses to start to grow. So those of you who run pension funds, those of you who have smaller companies and you're thinking about listing, please come and speak to me about whether or not you think this can work and to actually get some meat on the bones. Because I'm not your financial innovator. Hopefully there are many of you out there who are. Thank you. There was another question over here, I think. <coughs> Uh, Chris Reynolds from the City UK. Uh, sorry to bring you back to regulation, but um, on the positive side of it, what are the um, priority changes in regulation that you think would open up these opportunities? You talked about taxation, but what about in financial regulation? I think anything that promotes the EU single market and is done properly and done in a impact assessed way is actually something that I would support. Generally, and most of you who've ever come to see me know, I actually do not approve of extra layers of financial regulation unless there is evidence to demonstrate it's going to have the effect that people think it's going to have. I think there have been various mentions already this morning about short selling and CSDs. Um, they are both things that we spend a huge amount of time to, to actually, CDS is even. Um, we actually spend a lot of time with all these acronyms trying to, to make sure they don't have a negative impact. But we don't always succeed because the political uh, whim is maybe stronger sometimes than the evidence-based uh, assessments that should be made. But I, the single market is critical. And when you look at the data from, for example, MIFID, the original MIFID, which predates my time as a politician, it may have been costly to implement, but all the independent assessments suggest that that one piece of market legislation added 2% to the GDP of the EU as a whole and the vast majority of that was to the benefit of London. So in terms of potential growth when the single market starts to work and competition starts to flourish, I think that's the only area that I actually willingly support. In terms of risk management, there are other areas, but they don't add to growth, they don't add to, to productivity. The single market does, and that's the only area that if it, it does and does it well, is actually worth supporting. Kate, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you.